theyeshiva.net. Hi, everybody. This is so exciting. We have so many questions. Start typing, everybody, because we want your questions now. We've got Rabbi. Rabbi, thank you so much for coming back on our show. We're very grateful to you. Rabbi Y.Y. Y. Jacobson, and he is a legend, and he is, speaks to all uh, six continents and 50 states. He's been everywhere. He's all over the place. You know him, and he, if you are here at part one, you are sitting on the edge of your seat waiting to hear more practical tips. And I'm going to start with a pretty heavy one, Rabbi. I hope that's okay. Um, I have a woman who we got so much email. I'm going to start with a really heavy one. A woman said that she wants to do a marriage makeover. But her issue is that she, her husband said something to her a few years ago that caused her so much pain and she's having trouble forgiving and getting over it and starting a marriage makeover when she's just bearing the grudge. And he said, he's sorry 10 times. And I'll tell you what the story was. Basically, from my understanding, what she said, she said, he, her husband had been engaged before and broke it off. Then he met her and got married. And he said to her, you know, I was marrying her because she was pretty, but I married you for your neshama, for your soul. And the wife is like, okay. (laughs) So she said, even though I told him how much it hurt me, like he, you know, like he, he, I think what he was trying to do is explain, he, he was just caught up in her superficiality and that's why he was engaged before, but her, he's marrying her for her deep soul, but she felt very hurt by that and continues to feel less than and hurt by that. So I wanted, how can she have a marriage makeover when she's carrying the burden of not being able to forgive her husband for such a thing? Listen, first of all, you know, I, I, I am sorry for the pain. Such a comment can be perceived as a very painful comment. Um, you know, as you just explained, like the first one was beautiful and now me, you know, I just have some good values inside and you like my personality. But I really, really think, you know, we're all human. And the basis of a marriage, the basis of a relationship is the fact that we're vulnerable. We sometimes say the wrong things. We don't realize how the other person experiences our words or perceives it. And in this case, you know, if your husband apologized, I think without forgiveness, we can't build relationships because we all make mistakes on both sides. Men make mistakes, that's for sure. I could tell you from experience. And sometimes uh, even a woman can make a mistake. And I think the fact that, you know, we can be vulnerable about it and take accountability and apologize is really the basis of a relationship. So I think, you know, your husband apologized apparently a few times. So even though it was hurtful, I think it's important for you to do two things. First of all, you could communicate to him in an appropriate way why it's hard for you to over to get over this because of how it hurt you. And maybe there's also some internal things that you could look at. You know, if he really apologized and he was genuine, why does it still sit in you? Maybe there's something about you that you can also take responsibility for it. Like, what is it triggering inside of you? Is it maybe a comment that somebody in your family made when you were nine years old that's really coming back? In other words, yes, he is responsible for his comment. But ask yourself also, we should all ask ourselves this question, what is sitting in me that keeps on triggering this pain and doesn't allow me to get over it? And that can perhaps help as well. That can perhaps help as well. But bottom line, I think, we all owe it to ourselves and to our loved ones to be able to practice the art of forgiveness. The art of forgiveness does not mean that things don't hurt. The art of forgiveness just means they hurt, but I am powerful enough to be able to forgive. And I want to invest my future in closeness, not in estrangement. And that's where forgiveness comes from. It comes from realizing that you are powerful enough. I am not a victim. I don't have to live forever in a world of resentment. My soul is large enough to be able to contain my pain so I could forgive. I am not a victim. And number two, I want to choose a path of closeness, not a path of estrangement. So it's so good, but it, and that's, it's a great, you know, I I can imagine in your head, you know, she can work, work that out. And as she's listening to you, she's got strength and she's like, okay, you know, yep, I can do this, you know? And then in the heart of the moment, she's all dressed, ready to go to Simcoe, if anyone's going to get Simcoe's in COVID, whatever. But anyway, she's going, ready to go out and he doesn't comment like, oh, you look nice. 
right? So she's again, she replays in her ma- mind this resentment of, oh, because I'm not as pretty as X, Y, Z, you know, as, as the, your previous uh, engagement. So, right. so how does in the moment, what can right. you, what tool can you So, you know, every, every, every man is different. And sometimes, you know, we make a mistake as couples of thinking that if I have a good marriage, he would know exactly what I need at this moment, or she would know exactly what I need at this moment. And I'm sure there are some couples like that, but it's really unfair and unjust to define your marriage by that. We often do not get each other completely. And you know what? That's part of the beauty of marriage. There's a mystery. There's the unknown. The moment I know everything about my wife or she knows everything is about me, <laughs> it's, it's, there's something wrong there. There's an element of mystery. It's part of how halacha even orchestrates a marriage. There's the closeness and there's a distance. It's not just physical, it's also emotional. There's an element which is unknown. And therefore, part of a good marriage is actually sharing what you need at this moment, what would be meaningful for you at this moment, and not feel, oh, he should have known, she should have known, and if not, it's not a good marriage. It's a wonderful marriage. Communicate. Part of the trust of a marriage and part of the vulnerability of a marriage is that you can trust me and I can trust you to share what is necessary for you emotionally at this moment without feeling that you might get betrayed or you might be too vulnerable, I'm going to manipulate your vulnerability, then there are bigger problems. So yes, if there's something that is triggering an old memory, you should be able, hopefully, to communicate that in respectful ways to your husband. He should be able to listen to it and together you should be able to create a plan forward of when these triggers will come up again and again. There's nothing wrong with a husband telling a wife or a wife telling a husband, you know, when this situation comes up and you respond X, Y, Z, or you don't respond X, Y, Z, there is a trigger in me that is very difficult. And a loving couple that is committed to a relationship will respond with compassion and kindness, and it goes both ways. And the more we do this, the more we eliminate all of those toxic forces that can get in between us. It's fantastic. And for practical, just so you know, when and if the lady, if, I'm sure the woman who's, who asked this question is watching, but for everybody else, what that means is in the moment when you're sitting there, you're all dressed up and he's not saying anything and you're triggered and you're upset because he's not telling you. you. At that moment, what Rabbi is saying, you say, you know, I could really use a compliment on my outfit right now, you know, yeah. or even saying, that you know, um, uh, when 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 you're thinking of what you want him to say, say you know, listen, I know you apologize about that comment you made seven years ago or seventeen years ago. I don't know what it is, you know, and I know you apologize. You know what I think I need? I need you to b- tip the balance. It made me feel so badly. I want you to tip the balance the other way. You need to compliment me every day or every week or whatever. Like you know, give him the tools to make you happy. So, and, and I would also say it's helpful for all of us not always to second guess our spouse. We often allow our brains to second guess, to speculate. I know what he's thinking. I know what he's not thinking. He doesn't appreciate me. He appreciates this one. He said this. We make all of these complicated calculations that are often coming from the fact that we're projecting <laughs> our own traumas and fears and insecurities in the other person. You have to know, every person is their own universe and they live in their own universe. It's so important to communicate. Like, I shouldn't be second guessing my spouse. I don't know what she's thinking. I don't know what he's thinking. Maybe he's just, you know, thinking about some business meeting he had today that was very overwhelming and stressful. I don't know. That's why it's so important to be able to get feedback and say, so what are you thinking about now? Which also is, you know, I often get questions, you know, my husband made a comment yesterday, we went to his parents' house for a Shabbos meal, and he made a comment to his mother, it was so obnoxious, it was so rude, or the other way, we went to her mother's house and she made a comment about me, or my parents' house, whatever it is. And you know, let me tell you what happens in a bad marriage, what happens in a good marriage. In a bad marriage, he comes to her, she comes to him and says, why would you say such a thing about me? Why? Why? How could you be so cruel and narcissistic and selfish? You know what your mother does with this. She goes to her sister and she goes to... It's a third world war in our family. It's almost a Trump and Biden situation. In a good marriage, you also feel the pain. But instead of accusations, you ask a question. As a curiosity, 
as, as something that you're wondering about with curiosity, genuine curiosity. Like, why did you make that comment yesterday at the meal? What did you mean by that? And you may hear interesting things that can really eliminate a lot of the negative emotions. Be curious rather than accusatory. Be curious Le- rather than accusatory. Yeah. That's awesome. Okay, I know they're Le- flagging it's so you down. Funny. Well, yeah, Leah, it's so funny because this is what you have that whole chapter in your book. I don't remember which chapter, maybe seven on soliciting appreciation that you really can get your husband to know, to say things to you by you, like the ventriloquist, for example, or like what I do, which is I come down and my husband doesn't notice or comment. I'll be like, Hello, don't I look amazing? I look so good. You are so lucky to be going out with this woman right here because she looks so good. So like you really, you taught us it. You can get the comments without having to, you know, without expecting your husband to give you the comments. Right. And also, Rabbi, you know, one of the things we talk about very deeply is women say, well, if I had to solicit the comment, you know, then it doesn't, it's not worth anything. No, it's not worth as much as a genuine compliment that comes out of whatever, but it's better to get a B minus or a B plus compliment that you had to solicit than an A plus comment maybe will come once a month or once a year. So we, that's our whole thing is in terms of having your husband know, just as Rabbi saying, to solicit that what you need in the moment. And there's that's part of our job. That's our avoda of being a wife. Yeah, and I would also add, I would not call it disingenuine. I would not call it disingenuine. You know, let's say I go to a therapist because I'm having an issue with a child of mine. And the therapist explains to me that this is what my child needs from me. I didn't know it before. When I provide that need, I'm not being disingenuine. I was just educated. Sometimes I have to educate my friend, my spouse, or somebody else in the family that this is what I need. This is meaningful to me. They weren't being disingenuous. They just didn't know. They don't know. We see. We each have different, we're married, but we're not the same people. Husbands and wives see many things differently. They're different. They're opposite genders. They have different personalities. They're distinct individuals, and it should be that way. That's the beauty of a relationship. We bring together two distinct people to create harmony and to create a beautiful home and family together, Bezer Hashem. So the fact that you are sharing with him what your needs are, don't, and then he does it, it doesn't mean he was disingenuine. He could be very, very genuine. But people cannot be expected to always, or even often, know exactly what is happening in another person's mind, another person's heart, even after 20 years of a decent marriage. Don't feel bad about it. Fantastic. Okay, we have got a couple. Okay, yeah. So we have a fa- we have a couple of questions, but I'm just going to start with this Facebook okay. question because they're on the line right now, and I'm sure they want to hear the answer. Um, what if a husband helps and does the wife a favor, and she doesn't thank him for helping, and he's mad that she doesn't appreciate him, and he calls her spoiled? How does the wife handle that? It's a great question, and it's very obvious that there are two things happening simultaneously. On one hand, he is now somewhat of an eight-year-old. She has triggered some deep pain in him. He feels used, manipulated, not appreciated, not validated. When he's saying the word spoiled, what he's really saying is, I am searching to be so much closer to you. I wish you would be able to fill my voids more. I wish you would be able to know how much it would mean to me if you would say thank you for being here in the kitchen for 45 minutes and helping me sweep and mop and put away the dishes and put them into the dishwasher and put away the food and clean up after Shabbos. I wish you would do that. Unfortunately, he's not articulating it in that way. (laughs) He's calling her spoiled. So two things happen. Number one, he said something that was hurtful to his wife for which he has to apologize. Number two... She is just hearing the word, he called me spoiled. She's not hearing the pain behind that word. And this is where inner communication and trust is so important. Imagine if he would be able to tell her, honey, or my dear wife, I called you spoiled and I'm sorry. What I really meant was, it's so important for me. It would mean so much to me if when I'm here cleaning in the kitchen, you would show and tell me it means a lot to you. Thank you. And then the woman could say to him, and it would mean so much to me if 
you would say or do so and so. Now she might feel, excuse me, why shouldn't you be in the kitchen? Well, I'm the slave in the house. Well, I have the babies, I raise the kids, I have to slave away in the kitchen, and you're allowed to be in your office whenever you want, on your WhatsApps, checking the election results, and then you come to the kitchen and you're doing me a big favor. What, what? You're a narcissist, you're spoiled, you're a brat, your mother never raised you. You see where these conversations are going? Now this happens in our heads, this all happens in our heads. But instead of being accusatory, let's talk, every one of us, let's talk about our own pain. So imagine he can talk about the fact that he doesn't feel appreciated. She can talk about the fact that she feels, that he feels that she is the only one supposed to be in the kitchen. And when he comes to the kitchen, it's like he's a martyr. He just went on Messias Nefesh. She should be indebted to him for all of eternity till after the Messiah arrives. This is an inner pain that we're each feeling. If I could communicate that to my spouse, my spouse could communicate that to me, then we realize that behind the word spoiled, there was really a lot, a lot of emotion and a lot, a lot of pain. And when we could connect on that level of pain rather than just hurling insults on each other, we bring the relationship, we create closeness. And that which caused us to drift away actually becomes the impetus for deeper communication, for a deeper relationship. And that's how we have to start learning to communicate. Don't allow hurtful words to eclipse your inner pain. Let me tell you something. Anger is a secondary emotion 95% of the time. It covers up a more essential emotion, which is loneliness, pain. That's what I want to address. It's easy to become angry at my husband or angry at my wife and start saying, you're a this, you're a that, you're a that, you're a that. Okay, I'll have to apologize. But what's even more hurtful is we're not being honest. I'm not addressing my pain and loneliness. I said the word spoiled because something was triggered deep inside of me. Can I go there and really address it and turn to you and say, you know, this is what's happening. This is what I need. And this is what's hurting me so much. It's beautiful. The woman who okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Just, well, okay. wait, wait, sorry. Just tell her when you go and try what Rabbi's saying, do me a favor. Send us an email and let us know how it goes. Because, wow. Okay, sorry. Yeah, no, she just responded back. That's why I wanted to refer to it. She responded back to what um, something that Rabbi Y.Y. Jacobson just said. She said, but what if he uses other names as well? Like, spoiled is one thing, but he's also calling her lazy and stupid. Ouch. Yeah. Yeah. So, number one, it's painful. When somebody calls me spoiled, lazy, and stupid, especially not just somebody but somebody who's supposed to be the closest to me, it's hurtful. So I have to acknowledge the pain. I have to acknowledge the pain. And it's very easy at this point to drift away and to say to myself, I don't know why I married this guy. I never want to speak to him again. His selfishness and chutzpah knows no bounds. Look what I do for him day and night, day and night, day and night. I do everything for him. And all he could say about me is that I'm lazy and I'm spoiled and I'm bratty. You know, does he know how hard I work? Does he know that I'm up? Um, You know, all these types of things come to us. And therefore the conclusion is the guy has narcissistic personality disorder or he's just impossible. And I drift away and I go into my own environment and he goes into his own environment we ignore each other and it can last for a day it can last for two days and it can last for 10 years even if we communicate but there's uh something got eroded in the relationship so i say it's it's hurtful and it's painful and at that moment you may not be able to speak you just want to be able to create space for the pain and respect for the fact that you just hurt something that was very painful i'm spoiled I'm lazy, I'm careless, whatever the, whatever the title was, or even, you know, more obnoxious. Create space for it. Respect it, allow it to live, and contain it. But don't let it take over your life. Don't let that painful experience turn into the force that now dominates the marriage, and all the decisions for the next week are going to come from that place. Rather, contain it. And now ask yourself one question. What do I want to do going forward? Do I want to have a closer relationship? Or do I want to get a divorce and run away from this person forever? In most cases, the answer is, I want to heal this relationship. So now I have to ask myself. And I can't always do it at the moment. It's too painful. 
How do I try to heal? And the way to do that is be able to talk to my husband and to be able to say, I just want to say those words were very painful to me. They were painful. They were very, very hurting because I don't see myself as spoiled. I don't see myself as lazy at all. I'm not a perfect person, but that was very hurtful, very hurtful. And I want to assume, I want to assume and know he was hurting and he used those words which were very inappropriate and he should apologize. It's very important for him to apologize. But as I said, I assume that in most cases those words were eclipsing his own inner pain. And I want to be able to create a space that he can trust me and I can trust him with sharing what really is going on inside. And you will know, learn if he is open and vulnerable that something was triggered inside of him and it's maybe sitting in him. And it's very hurtful for him and it's hurtful for me. And when we could communicate on that level, when I can discuss what is hurting me in this relationship, what do I feel I'm not getting from my husband? My husband could talk about what he feels he's not getting from his wife. Now, we don't have to resort to anger because we identified the real emotions rather than the cover-up emotions. And we can apologize, he can apologize in this case, and learn to forgive. And actually, this will make us a closer couple and a better marriage. Here is the rule. Whenever a couple takes something that caused them to drift away and uses that as an impetus to become closer, they have now taken their weakest link and turned it into their most powerful link. Whenever we strengthen our marriage in those areas that are most painful, we create the most powerful marriage because we're transforming the very negativity into positivity and there's no light like the light that transforms darkness. So whenever I can go back to that place where he called me names or she called me names or we called each other names and we can identify our vulnerable void and pain and then we can be here for each other in that space, OMG, you have now just created very powerful positive energy in your marriage that really allows you to withstand a lot of difficulties. So it, 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 this is so endless and so powerful. The, the issue I'm grappling with is that takes a lot of skills to do what you're saying. I mean, is that what you yeah. need a third party for that? Or, I mean, in other words, is there like a step-by-step? You, you, step? you need a third party if this is not practiced regularly and if there is a fundamental lack of trust, then you're going to need a third party because there's too much. If this is happening constantly, if every Matzai Shabbos there's another fight, if every Friday afternoon there's a huge fight with insults, I'm not talking about disagreements. A Jewish couple has disagreements. I'm not talking about the small fights. Uh, that's, that's what I'm talking about. If this is constantly going on with name calling and insulting and just drifting away from each other and having these fights and ignoring and you know for a day and two days she doesn't speak to me, he doesn't speak to me and, and so on and so forth, then there is toxicity in the home. You probably need a lot of work and you probably need a third party to be able to help you deal with this. But if you have been practicing these types of communication and if there is fundamental trust, then you often don't need a third party. Then you have to go on a walk or order some sushi and put away the phones and just have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation. You know, there are the five love languages. There are love languages that he probably yearns and he's not getting. Or there are love languages that she yearns and she's not getting. And when you could start communicating on that level, instead of the insult, spoiled, lazy, bratty, obnoxious, rude, a user. No, 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 no. What, what are you feeling, my dear husband? Talk about your feelings. What happened in the kitchen? You swept, you washed the dishes, and your wife didn't say anything. I want to know what happened in your heart. What happened? And I could, I, I'm not a prophet, but I could say that in many, many situations, what happened was he became a nine-year-old at that moment. Something was triggered from childhood, a very deep pain, a very deep sensitivity, where again, I put myself out there and I'm being smacked in the face. And it's built up in a way that his wife doesn't even know. She doesn't even know. Because probably, you know why she didn't say thank you? Because she does this every night. <laughs> Nobody says her thank you. She does every night. She doesn't, she didn't even, re maybe, I don't know. I don't know, but it's very possible. So imagine if they could communicate on this level, 
right? And they could see, he could see that she's not being selfish. And she can see that he's having a pain that has to be addressed and they can be here for each other. That's magic. Fantastic. Okay, go ahead with the other one. I've got a so don't have, give up. Don't give don't up give on up. these types of conversations. Yeah, don't give up. Um, because so because you, you, I know some of you may be listening and saying, Rabbi, why, why? You're, you're a helpless romantic. This is not how it works. We get into fights constantly. We take it seriously. But I'm saying that if you have two mature people, I know you need two mature people for this. And you need two fundamentally healthy people. As I said in last session, and this, I don't have to elaborate on it. Sometimes there's an issue of personality disorder, mental illness, and deep, deep trauma. But when you're talking about a fundamentally healthy person, and I know none of us are completely healthy. We all have mishagasa. But generally, two mature people who can talk about their issues without killing each other, these conversations are crucial. This, these, these vulnerable, simple, and may I say, sometimes very childlike conversations are what heal our deepest voids in a marriage. It's cr- crucial. A gorgeous, gorgeous question for you, because I get this question a lot, which is people who have, a, you know, some kind of dysfunction, maybe mental illness, maybe, you know, on either side or whatever they have. And they say, is our Masora, Leia, Leia, is our Masora for me as well? And the answer I give them is, of course, like it didn't say when our Masura came from Harsinai, it didn't, you know, it didn't say, okay, here's how to have a, a Shalom bias. Here's exactly what you need to do. And then with a little asterisk and at the bottom, unless you are, are, are not normal, you know, or unless you're dysfunctional. I, I once gave a, a class and I said, and everyone who has dysfunctional childhood, raise your hand. And everyone's kind of like, oh, you know, everybody, you know what I'm saying? So what's normal? So our Masora is for all you didn't, it's for all, all, for everybody, every person um, that our Masora will take care of them. So there are exceptions of where you might need a third party, but uh, and and also uh, a, a Rebbitzin, very very uh, Re- Rebbitzin, uh Debbie Fox, uh, who's a, a genius in terms of um, uh, of uh, of um, uh, she's a, a doctor um, of uh, I think psychology. But anyway, it, it, she said that it's very crucial. Some if you uh, if a woman is being the receiver and you're teaching her how to receive and how to you know um, uh, from our Masora and she's in an abusive situation, it could make things worse. So there's a fine line between where our Masura, you follow it to a T and every, you know, dot every I. And there's a, a, a um, uh, there's, then there's a fine line where you come into, I guess, mental health issues or certain extenuating circumstances. Does Rabbi, can you shed some light on this for us? Because it's, uh, it's a... Yeah, of course. Very, very important question. I think there is a fundamental difference about the situation. I uh, had a telephone uh, conversation, a, 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 a conference call uh, two nights ago with approximately 20 women who are all in a marriage with somebody who's suffering from mental illness. So uh, I spoke to them and then there were a lot of questions and answers. And it was very obvious that you have two different streams. You have somebody who's suffering from mental illness or personality disorder or a very deep trauma Maybe they were molested as a child or they went through some other very difficult situation that really gets stuck in the body. And you know, the body holds the score, as they say today famously, so the trauma could sit in our body and it really creates blockages and these people can't function. So sometimes you have a situation where a person is ready to take responsibility, where a person could say, I need help. I have borderline personality, I have narcissistic personality disorder, order. I am manic depressive, I have bipolar, I have psychosis, I'm schizophrenic, whatever it is. Very, very painful, very painful. I am living in, I have depression, I have serious depression, maybe clinical depression. I am, I am a traumatized person from a certain type of upbringing or experiences that I had, and it's about me. I am in terrible, terrible pain. And when my wife says X, Y, and Z, I go crazy. I have a meltdown. It has nothing to do with her. It has to do with my own illness. And I need to get help. And when a person can take responsibility for that, then there is a lot of hope. Because then I could 
take the medication I need or live the lifestyle I need, the medications, the vitamins, the exercise, the diets, the work schedule, the routine, because all of the, you know, a holistic perspective is important, not just meds, because uh, we are holistic people. We're not just compartmentalized people. Then it's a game changer. If the person is ready to take responsibility and stop blaming their spouse for everything that's, the, for everything that's problematic in their life, because they can attribute it to their own challenges, and they need a lot of support, and we should support them, we should love them, we should give them the chizuk that they need, but the responsibility, the buck stops here. Don't blame your wife for your mental illness. If that step has not been taken, if the person is in denial, as I say, denial is not only a river in Egypt, it's part of people's lives, and therefore, as the famous title, walking on eggshells, basically you have to walk on eggshells in front of your husband. Whatever you say is not good. Whatever you do is not good. Nothing. He can try everything or you can try everything. Works both ways. Depends who has the illness. And nothing is good enough. Now we're dealing with a very, very difficult situation that you have to acknowledge because here you can do everything and it's not going to help because there is fundamentally something broken inside of him or inside of her. And if he's not ready or she's not ready to take any responsibility, now you have to make a very serious choice and you need a lot of support for this choice. And the choice you have to make are is as follows. What are the pros to remain in this relationship? What are the pros? What are the cons? Do the pros outweigh the cons? In other words, there is pain here, and it's very difficult pain, and it's not going away tomorrow or after tomorrow because this guy is completely in denial. Now it's your responsibility and very painful responsibility to ask yourself, can I survive in this relationship? Will I become a doormat? Will I become an abused schmata? Will I lose my soul and lose my life? Or no, I can handle this. Could huh? a woman, should a woman be... Um, following the Masora from her Sinai to in the relationship in that, in that to her, to her husband. In other words, she should be doing, should she be the receiver? Should she be doing all of the things that we teach in our Masora of how to be a wife? I think that part of the Masora, part of the Masora is that whenever I'm in a relationship, I have to be able to protect my boundaries and I have to be able to protect my children's boundaries and I cannot become a sacrifice on the altar of somebody else's abuse and illness. That is part of our Messiah. Our Messiah teaches, as the Rambam says, the Shulchan Aruch says, the Gemara says, and Yavamas, the sages have commanded us, and this is a tradition of millennia, every human being must love his spouse, his wife, like himself, and he must respect his wife more than he respects himself. That's directly out of our Messiah. He has to love his wife like he loves himself, and he has to respect his wife more than he respects himself. That's a fascinating, fascinating statement that was not written 50 years ago. It was written thousands of years ago. And what we learn from this is, if that is missing, it's very hard for a woman to be able to function, and to function as a normal person. So part of our Messiah is that we have to be able to protect our boundaries and our dignity, not because we're selfish, but simply because... That's the only way in which I could fulfill my mission in life, in which I can be a person, a Jew, a woman, a wife, a mother, a friend, a spouse, etc. So part of our Messiah is always making sure that boundaries are not crossed in a way that one person really becomes just a doormat and, 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 and a shmata. And, and, and could be terribly, terribly abused and manipulated. On the other hand, our Messiah teaches that we should never allow ego to get involved. In other words, I should not be making decisions from my ego, which is making decisions from weakness. I want to make decisions from my deepest core, which is divine. Every human being at their core is a chelik elekami mal mamash. You're a piece of Hashem. And therefore, at your core, you're invincible, you're wholesome, you're confident. You're powerful. You're full of possibility, joy, optimism. Because you're an ambassador of Hashem in this world. I want to make decisions from that space. I don't want to make decisions from my weakest space. I want to make decisions from my most powerful, godly, and sacred space. Which never has to resort to fear, insecurity, manipulation, and superficiality to be able to feel confident. So for... The, for anybody who is questioning whether which category they fit, if they're if they've got issues or not, 
this is something to go speak to a rabbi, a rabbitson, a clergy person, and to, to a therapist to find out and get a third party involved to see. And important, important, as I mentioned also in the first session, that you're talking to somebody who's an expert in this field. Just like if there's a heart problem, you don't go to a dentist. <laughs> Dentists are wonderful people, but you have to go to a cardiologist. And conversely, if I have pain in my tooth, I don't go to the greatest neuroscientist in Harvard University, not because he's not a great neuroscientist, but because my, I, I, need a, I need a filling in my tooth. So you really have to go to somebody who's, who's, who's sensitive and who's empathetic. It's very important. As I, as I mentioned this, I think I said it last time, be an educated consumer. Don't just surrender your fate to a third party and he or she will decide everything for you. That's not how life works. You have to, I have to take responsibility for my life. We want to get advice from people, but you want to make sure that that advice resonates with you. And you can't always follow things blindly when you're sensing that there's something destructive happening. Okay, we have so many questions coming up. Okay, yeah, yeah, so no, so firstly, um, from Torah Anytime's Facebook, um, Stacy Button said, Back to that um, soliciting appreciation or telling your husband you look pretty. She said, there is something also that when a woman feels comfortable to share that, hey, I look great today. What are your thoughts? Her husband then looks at his wife with pride. That he's a confident wife, which then reflects and sinks in, plant the seed and watch it grow. That's awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, isn't it awesome? Yeah. So, so don't worry about feeling confident and complimenting yourself because that works. Okay. So the question, next question that came in, also a little bit heavy. I'm going to break it down in twos. Um, so basically the first part is this woman writes, I feel very confused and deflated, upset about my relationship with my husband. I have listened. I just listened. This was from the, she had watched last show and I'm happy that there'll be a part two because I would love it if something could be clarified. Rabbi YY talks about a spouse with a lot of anxiety, trauma and suffering. What you just spoke about. I am that person. Yes, I probably do bring it on myself and a lot is in my head, but it's still very real suffering for which I deal with it every day and it's excruciating. I feel I do take responsibility for it and I'm learning not to blame anyone else for what goes wrong. And I do have someone that I talk to, but the following still bothers me. When I get overwhelmed, frustrated, about to explode, and I say things to my husband, not blaming, he ignores my pain. When I question why he's ignoring it, he says that he's not a therapist and he ignores me. It does not mean he's rejecting me. I feel he is. I don't expect him to be my therapist or to make everything go away but to be there for me and listening to Rabbi YY that this is what a spouse should be as long as the spouse in question is taking responsibility, I feel he's not giving me what I need. So, Shari, what's the ultimate question? Also, I got- so The ultimate question, I'm sorry, the ultimate question is she's saying, I'm taking responsibility. I'm not blaming my husband, but when I'm frustrated and I need him to support me and I'm just like venting to him, he says, I'm not a therapist. Like, what are you telling me all this for? And she goes, I don't feel he's supporting me. I don't need him to be my therapist, but I do want him to listen when I'm venting and and hear me out. Right. So so answer this one quickly, Rabbi, because I've got like 19 other questions and I feel like we put a lot of time into the mental health issue. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So so <laughs> I don't mean to get very analytical, but I would be very curious about this. Why is it so hard for him to listen and empathize with my pain? It's probably triggering something in him. I would be curious. Like if, if, my if somebody you love comes to you and says, you know, I really had a miserable day today. I double parked and my car got towed away and I had to pay 900. You know, you ever got your car towed away? Those of you who had the joy of living in New York. And, 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 and I had no food and I'm starving and I have a headache and I came down with the flu. Whatever it is. Right. I mean, the first thing you do with a friend is you listen, you empathize, you say, I'm so sorry. You know, anything I can do for you, well, that must have been hard. So why, why would it be so difficult for him? not to find solutions, but just to empathize with his wife. Um, I would be very curious about that and ask him really, is this, is this triggering something in you? What does it do to you? Does it make you feel maybe that your wife is so needy that she can't get her life together? Like really, what is it, what is it doing to him? I would be very curious about this. Maybe a third party can be helpful. Like why can't he just be there for his wife? And, and does he know that he could also do the same thing and be vulnerable towards towards his wife. Maybe he needs a little training. Maybe he needs a little prompting. Maybe it can even be simple. Can she communicate to him how important and, and necessary and, um, and, and, and how much she would cherish the opportunity for him to take, to take it in and to, to listen. It could be, maybe, 
huh? could be it could be that when when you know they first started getting married she would listen to him uh, it, he would listen to her and she would tell all the stuff that happened this day and then it would somehow turn into her blaming him or her attacking him or saying and this didn't go right so it's this- triggering it may be triggering in him oh she's really blaming me even though she's not so that needs a real conversation. And if they can't have it on their own, that, and it won't be explosive, it's important to bring somebody in that can help them with it. But that's an, 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 an important conversation. It's also, I do also want to say, and I think somebody mentioned it before, right? From, and I think it's a very important point, and that is, you know, at least there's a, I would say probably most men appreciate very much to see the inner strength and confidence of their spouses. Never be afraid to display that. Uh, just like most women want to see a man, you know, they don't want to have a, a they, they want to see a man. They like the manliness of the man. Men, I think, very often appreciate to see the confidence and inner resilience and strength of a woman. You should never be bashful to display that. It's actually very endearing, I think, at least for most men. That's a good coming from a man, a rabbi in a man. Uh, so I, we, I want to make sure we get to, can rabbi give us some more practical tips for marriage makeover of how to how to clean the slate, how to start from from fresh. The ones you gave last week were to have conversations, uh, uh, no politics, no cell phones, whatever, to communicate, um, to constantly reconnect that if there's something happened that it caused upset in the relationship to constantly re- react. Uh, reconnect and every interaction can either build or tear apart and so you have to think about it you know be be very conscious about your decision those are the three things we learned from number one if you want an explanation everybody click and watch last week's show if you haven't seen it already but we want more practical marriage makeover advice okay so the first thing i would (laughs) suggest everybody very practically is twice a day twice a day Say something complimentary to your spouse. Those men who are listening, listening illegally, I'm saying this to you as well, and to the women. Twice a day, maybe in the morning and in the evening or whenever you can, say something kind, complimentary to your spouse, especially something that, that has to be genuine. I don't mean, you know, flattery that is external. Something that's genuine and authentic. And especially if you know the love language of your spouse, and hopefully at this point you do, Try to fill that at least twice a day. For example, for some men, a compliment of a spouse, a compliment of a wife means the world. It could be how hard they work, how committed they are to their children, how they dress. It could be something about their looks, about their physique, about their wisdom, about their commitment, about their idealism, about their learning, about their davening, about their mitzvahs, about their generosity, whatever it is. Even about the cleanliness of the walk-in closet or the bathroom or the bed, whatever it is, small or big. But if words of affirmation mean a lot to your husband, to your wife, twice a day, at least twice a day, you could do it five times a day. And the same is true with the other languages of love. But try twice a day to say something that is positive, complimentary building. I think that would be a tremendous asset for everybody's marriage. That's the first thing I would say, very practical and very doable. It doesn't take a lot. You just have to be, you have to be conscientious. Put a timer on your phone, a little Ah. ding. Put a timer on your phone, a little ding comes on saying compliment hubby. Yeah. 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 I saw a video, somebody had a video about, somebody spoke about his parents and he said his his father would wake up early in the morning and make his mother breakfast every single morning and write a love note to her that was waiting by the breakfast table. Okay, that's what creates magic in a marriage. You know, they felt that appreciation. So I'm not giving that as a practical instruction to every single person to wake up in the morning. Maybe it's a beautiful idea if you can do it. But that concept of, of, of doing something every day, saying something every day, engaging in an act or a gesture or a statement, a word, just communication every day that builds that trust, that closeness, that relationship. And it begins with simply saying a compliment, saying something positive about the person or the other forms of love in the famous five languages of love. I would think that, say that's one thing. Another, I think, very powerful very powerful, practical tool. I learned once, there's a big therapist in California. He once wrote a book about therapy. And he told there a a, a lovely story. And he said that a woman once came to him and she shared something with him. 
and it was very, very moving. She had a hard time with her father. They did not get along. And they decided once to go on a weekend a trip, a road trip, to p- try to be able to connect. Her father was very disagreeable always. Whatever she said, he disagreed. And I think it was before her marriage, and she wanted to connect to her father. And they went on this road trip in California. And she was, uh, she was driving, and her father was in the passenger seat, and she looked out her window, and she said, Wow, Daddy, look how beautiful the landscape is. Look out the window. And he looked out of his window. And he says, this is beautiful? It's a cesspool. It's a sewage system. It's disgusting. And she's like, oh my God, he can't even agree about the landscape. And she lifted up her hands in despair, you know, like one of these. And she said, forget it. Let's quit this road trip. Let's go home. And their relationships were not mended. 30 years later, she's married with her husband on a road trip in California. And suddenly they're going down the same road. She went with her father three decades earlier. This time, her husband is driving. She's in the passenger seat. And literally, her husband says, Honey, look out your window. The landscape is so beautiful. And she looks out her window, and what does she see? She sees a sewage system. And she realizes that her father was not disagreeing with her. Her father was just sharing what he sees from her wind, from his window. From her window, there was a different landscape. And at that moment, she realized the truth. And that is, a couple are driving in the same car, but they're not looking out of the same window. They're on the same journey. They're on the same highway. They're hopefully heading to the same destination, a binyan adeyad. But they're looking out of two different windows. And you know what? It's fine. From my window, the world looks this way. From your window, the world looks this way. And maybe throughout my life, I will never ever be able to convince you to always see things through my window. You're going to see it through your window. I will see it through my window. But that's not the problem. The problem is not that we have two different windows. The problem is when we cannot respect each other's windows, when we cannot listen to the other person's windows, and when we lose trust and we start thinking that because you have a different perspective and a different window to reality, therefore somehow you don't like me, you're not here for me, you're not in tune with me, you can't be close to me, and so forth. If we could learn that we sometimes have two windows and yet we can share what life looks like from your window, and I could share what life looks like from my window, we can have an unbelievably exciting and meaningful and loving road trip through the road of life. <laughs> That's okay, I've got, I've got, I'm filled up here with questions. Yeah. No, people, some, somebody is asking, they're like, okay, these are amazing practical tools. We need more. Okay, <laughs> Okay, let's do that. Let's go with that rather than the questions. I want to make yeah, sure. Yeah, no, because more. I have one more. I have one more question. It's so heavy. So I figure like, let's just, let's get just the, get the practical. Do, do the question and then I'll do the, another practical tool. Do, do the no, question. No, 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 practical. The practical. We have, so, we have like, literally we have, what are we at? 10 minutes? Ugh, yeah, so yeah, 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 yeah. We have, we need practical. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I think... <laughs> I think another very practical tool is, and I think we touched on this, but I think it's very important to elaborate. A lot of couples often feel that their marriage is not good. You know why? They'll tell me, you know, we had an amazing day together. Yesterday was an amazing day and it was an amazing night. And today I'm angry at him or or he's angry at me. It, It means that our marriage is in the dumps. And I think it's a very big mistake that we make. And Maybe, maybe I'm saying this a little sharp, but I think it's important to understand. It's very, very impractical to expect it to be any other way. Because husbands and wives, even when we're married many years, fundamentally, there are so many differences. The fact that they should be close is unique. It's it's unique. It's something exceptional. It's something extraordinary. Or to put it differently, marriage inherently left to its own devices 
is an unstable relationship. You're going to drift away. It's not a chiddish. Don't look at it as a failure. We had an unbelievable week together. We went on vacation. We went here. We went there. It was gewaldic. Now we come back and something happened and we're in a fight. You're normal. You're normal. In order to create this oneness, you have to constantly, it says that Hashem recreates the world every single moment. Why? Because creation, something from nothing, is a paradox. So it has to be done every single moment, again and again and again. Bringing together two people who are different, that they should really become one and trust each other, and from two people to create oneness, is something that you can expect. It just remains that way because yesterday we had an unbelievable night that, or yesterday we had an unbelievable day. No, you have to once again demonstrate that you're here for me and I have to once again demonstrate that I'm here for you. So last night before he went to sleep, he said, I love you and I appreciate you. And then he went to sleep, okay? Beautiful. It's an amazing thing to do. Okay. The next day, he said, I already said it last night. No, 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 no. Today we got to once again remarry. <laughs> in other words, marriage is not something that happens once. Even in halacha, you know that? Marriage is something that happens every single moment because emotionally also, we were married for 20 years and tomorrow we have to get married again. And the next day we have to get married again. Good. It's good. <laughs> I'm, I'm with you. Okay, what, we got time for another... Well, well it, just, it happens to be somebody asked on that is that it just seems like it's so much work and so much work on the woman, especially because the, obviously our show is geared towards women. So the women are hearing it. And so often, and we get this a lot, so often the men are not learning and taking these kind of classes. And it just, it's so much on a woman. It almost seems too heavy of a burden to carry. Excellent question. So first of all, I have to say a few things. First of all, that's why you should have your husbands listen to my classes. <laughs> You should have your husbands listen to my classes on the yeshiva.net because I speak a lot to men about this. And I don't mean only mine. I mean, husbands have to learn about this as well. Number one, it shouldn't only be work on the wife. That doesn't make sense. By definition, this is a joined, a joined uh, effort. Of course, there's situations where the husband is just out for lunch and then there's work that remains on one party. And that's, but that's a tragic situation. We always try to have two people working together. That's number one. Number two, this is work, no question. Marriage, a good marriage is work. And you know what else? I don't have to tell this to this audience. Raising children is also work. <laughs> and again, I, I, I don't, I, I'm going to sound arrogant when I say to this audience. And, and birthing children into this world is work. And you know what? Anything that is of timeless value is work. Things that don't take any work are usually not very significant. Yes, having a good marriage is work. But you know what? When we put in this work, it creates one of the deepest pleasures and joys in life. And that's why it's well worth it. Because when we create this work, we put in this work, and we create a situation of a marriage that's filled with trust and respect, it creates one of the greatest miracles in the world. And that is the miracle of a marriage that is healthy, beautiful, and inspiring. And it's also the greatest gift we can give to the next generation. What, what I think parents, that what's bothering them, Rabbi, is, 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 that, is that it's not, it doesn't seem fair. They could realize, okay, if I put the work in, I'm going to be rewarded today, eternally, I'll be closeness or whatever. It just doesn't feel fair. Why am I the one always who has to do the work? I think that's what the, what's so well, hard. I, I, re I really think that that's really an unfair statement to say that the woman is the one who has to put in all the work for Shalom Bias and the husband doesn't have to put in the work. I don't know who ever formulated such a definition, such a, uh, such a that's law. That's how women so, feel. I'm not saying that that's the Masorah. Uh, uh, that's not the Masorah So, so, so this, this, is, this does not say anywhere in Torah that it's the, it's the obligation of the woman. In fact, in fact, if you read the Ksuva, which is the official marriage contract under the Chuppah, yeah, I never realized this. I was once doing a chuppah in California, and you know who came to the chuppah? Dr. Laura. You remember Dr. Laura? <laughs> Laura Schlesinger. She was at the chuppah because she knew somebody there. And I spoke. And the next day on her radio show, she had a talk show, she, in seven, uh, I think uh, ABC, she spoke a half an hour about the chuppah and my commentary on the chuppah. And she said something very interesting. She said, I translated the ksuva. So I, she said, it's interesting, I'm, I'm listening to the marriage contract, 
It's all the man has to do this, I do this, 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 this. And the woman, she says, I remember on the radio, she just got to show up. She just got to show up. She says, that's interesting, written 2,000 years ago. When you look actually a real Torah, the real obligations of the marriage is on the man. So now you're asking me, but why does everybody feel the other way? And that's, that's, and that's really because of the power of the Jewish woman. The reason that women feel this way is not because it is that way. It's because you feel that way. Because you experience in your soul the power of a relationship. And you experience in your soul the power that exists long term for eternity when there's a good marriage. It's what Sarah saw immediately when Yishmael would stay in the house. Avram didn't realize it. Avram said, let Yishmael stay in the house. We'll have a Palestinian state near a Jewish state, Yitzchak and Yishmael. Sarah knew she had long-term vision. She knew that her child will never be able to be a Jewish child if Yishmael is there. There has to be separation. There has to be boundaries. She saw eternity. That's the power of a woman. And that's why I think women feel so deeply the responsibility. And that's because you're a woman. You were blessed to feel and sense that which has timeless value and enduring eternal vitality for the Jewish people. That's what you feel. And that's why you feel such a pressure. But in reality, this is something that must be a joint effort. And every husband in the world must know that it's his responsibility, as it's his wife's duty, to be able to work together on creating a relationship. And let's also understand, once you start doing this, after a few weeks, after a few months, the work changes completely. It's work, but it's, 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 it's blissful. Because there is, there is trust, there is connection, there is harmony. So once you overcome those basic real obstacles and you are now, there is a flow. Once that flow is in motion, everything changes. It may be work, but it's a different type of work. It's almost like the greatest violinist playing his violin. It's a lot of work, but it's, it's work that fills the soul with joy. Wow, it's fantastic. This has been absolutely great. We're actually out of time. I want to, how can people get in touch with you, Rabbi? www.theyeshiva.net is where my classes are posted and they can also write if you have any questions you can write there and they'll send it to me it could be confidential as well and also I give every single week a class especially for women before Corona was live in Muncie now for now it's on Zoom and everybody is invited it's Tuesday morning 9.45 a.m. a class for women at theyeshiva.net, that's T-H-E-Y-E-S-H-I-V-A dot net, as Leia says, not org, not com, but net. And uh, so every Tuesday morning, 9.45, all the women and girls are invited to theyeshiva.net for a weekly women's class. And I hope we can keep in touch. And I bless all of you and myself and all of Klyestol. We should have the courage and the resilience and the faith and the fortitude and the wisdom to be able to really build our marriages and families in the most inspiring and beautiful way. And Hashem should give you all bracha and atzlacha adbid lai with nachas, health, happiness, and prosperity. Oh, man, it was just worth it just for that. And I also want to say, actually, and you can respond to this because it just, just came in my head because it's part of this whole thing we're talking about, is women should understand that, yes, it might be in the ketubah, that, uh, yeah, in the marriage contract, that a man has to provide and a woman has to just show up. And I totally hear that. But there's another aspect that I think it's crucial to remember. And that is there is so much a woman can do to influence her husband to take care of her. And that's what we're learning. That's, that's the whole point of the ladies' talk show is what can we do to bring closeness into our relationships? There's no, there's no question. There's no question. That if you get to know your husband a little bit and you respond not from anger and fear, but from deep understanding and wisdom, and you know, I don't know today that women are smart, and Bini Yaseira was given to the woman more than the man, there are even certain things you tell your husband that can turn him into a king or turn him into a mouse. Literally, you can bring out from your husband the best and the most beautiful and sometimes the worst. Now, this is not to put blame on the woman if a husband is behaving in a wrong way. That's completely unfair and unjust. But nonetheless, it's important for women to know their power. When you validate, compliment, build up, 
uh, give that which your husband needs, it, 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 it has an unbelievable impact and influence for which he will forever be grateful. Of course, it also works the other way, and it has to always be in a functional and respectful and reciprocal way, not talking about an abusive way, God forbid. But this is a tremendous power that, you know, very often in the age of feminism, which focuses so much on equality, and there's a lot of gifts to that idea, but there's also a lot of women forgot the power of a woman that our grandmothers knew very, very well, our great-grandmothers. They knew the power, the power of a woman to be able to set the atmosphere in the home, to be able to create a certain ambiance, to be able to create a certain spirituality and kedusha in the house, and really to be able sometimes to bring out the best within their husbands, to become the wind beneath their wings and allow their husbands to soar in ways that are unprecedented. Of course, if you're taking this in a way of guilt or in an abusive way that you didn't understand what I'm saying, I'm talking about in a healthy, functional relationship. That's fantastic, Rabbi. Thank you so much for joining us. It's an honor to have you. Your words Thank you wisdom. for the privilege. Yeah. And thank you. You should have tremendous Hatzloch and the ladies talk show and everything to be able to inspire and unite Jewish women. And as Chazal say, that b'schus of the women, we left Mitzrayim, and Arizal says that the women at the end of Golos are a reincarnation of the women of Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. So it's in the schus of the vision and the fortitude and the wisdom and the power of women that we will get out of a Golos consciousness into a Geula consciousness and a Geula reality. Amen. 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 This is Rich Heimer for the Ladies Talk Show. We'll see you guys next time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ray. This class is brought to you by the yeshiva.net. Please help us continue the classes. Make even a small contribution at www.theyeshiva.net slash donate.